does is to bring together a very diverse sector. We have the National Trust, Historic Houses Association, Council for, Business, for British Archaeology and a huge range of very, very small organisations, railways, war memorials, piers, cinemas, you name it, there's somebody studying it and championing it. So we bring them all together in a united voice and we lobby, we have an office in Westminster and we lobby for changes in legislation and policy to make a better framework so that we can all do more with our heritage and to realise the benefits, and that's for government, communities and individuals. And so that's what we do, we work very hard at it, my colleagues are here and they'll testify to that. Um, the reason that we run these, these debates is to connect heritage with the big issues of the day. So this is the fifth in our series. We've done heritage and tourism, heritage and television, heritage and profit, heritage and philanthropy, and this one, heritage and identity, because identity is a very topical issue, social cohesion, all this sort of stuff, is very much um, an interest in academia, but also in public policy. And one of the reasons that, well, the main reason that we actually run these debates is to connect the academic community with those working in public policy, the people like us who are doing advocacy and lobbying all the time. We need to know what's going on in the academic world, and they need to know what our challenges are so that we can meet in the middle. We want to be able to use their research in our advocacy, but unless we get their research out into the public domain and into communities like this, I feel that it's not being properly used. And so that's the reason that we do, um, um, we, we run this series of debates. And many thanks both to Ecclesiastical, which is our sponsor, and also to the um, School of Arts and Culture, which is our university partner, and the Lord's have a university partner, particularly today because Peter's taken over and stepped into the breach. And so this event is um, divided into, into three parts. The first <coughs> one is here, uh, obviously, with the academic speaking today and the question and answer session when there's that interaction here. And then afterwards, of course, when it's uh, our reception, hopefully you will communicate and find out colleagues older than you, that would be great. And the third bit is around those four questions that you all asked in your reminder. And I'm very glad that Tony Henderson from the Newcastle Journal is here tonight, because it's he who very kindly gave us such promotion last Thursday, and is going to follow it up with some ideas about what symbol, best symbols are for the North East and so on. We have had some replies from MPs. We had a reply from Canada, from somebody who's been in Canada for 47 years, but still says that she loves the North East dearly, and the bridges are the best symbol she knows. So it'd be really interesting to have discussions about all these sorts of things. And uh, if I can hand over now to Peter, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, just a few words um, from me to, to start a little focus of what I hope we'll be talking about um, over the next hour and a half or so. Uh, I've welcomed you to the university already, but I haven't formally welcomed you to the King's Hall. Of course, the King's Hall named after Edward VII, but um, in, I think it was January 1968, um, a few months before he was assassinated, 
um, Martin Luther King stood in this hall um, to give uh, a valid a speech, having just been awarded a honorary degree from the university, um, almost in exactly the spot that I stand. And of course, Martin Luther King um, had a major influence on many of our lives in terms of identity and um, what was going on in America at that stage, and I'm sure he would have um, a, a significant interest in the recent elections um, in America um, that happened yesterday. Identity is a critical element of what we all are and who we all are. My Vice-Chancellor comes round once a year and asks all heads of school two questions. And the first one is relatively easy to answer. Um, he comes in and he says, Peter, is the research done in arts and cultures good research? And I say, yes, Vice-Chancellor, our research is excellent. We do really good research. And he says, very good, very good. What's it good for, is his second question. And that's much more difficult to actually give a evidence-based response to. And it touches on what Kate has just said. Why do we do our research and how do we get it out to the general public and to policymakers and to anybody else for whom the research that we do, that we feel is important, how do we get that message across? Yes, evenings like this, but there should be a plethora of other ways. And that's an issue that is um, increasingly important for universities um, as we go. Heritage and its, or the identity of individuals and of groups and of societies is critically important. As an individual, you identify your own identity. You create your own identity. But others, of course, may disagree with that identity and give you a different version of your identity. Just let me give myself as an example. I was born in Manchester. I have, as everybody else in the room, had four grandparents. But unlike most of you in the room, I would guess, I'm a true Brit in that my four grandparents were English, Irish, Scottish and Welsh. I have always thought of myself as British and yet it was when I went to Scotland to go to university that I firmly understood for the first time in my life that I was English. As I would sail through the air towards the lock every time England beat Scotland at any sporting activity because they were so angry with me, or I would sail through the air on any day that Scotland beat England at any sporting activity because they were so pleased they'd beaten the English. I was firmly, firmly English. I still identify as a Mancunian. My family laugh at me when I say that because actually I left Manchester when I was one or a few months afterwards. And yet when I go back to Manchester, as we did a few weeks ago where my daughters are thinking of going to university, good lasses, I immediately empathise with my surroundings. There's the town hall and it's all of the stories that my family tell me, told me, about them and our family are rooted in Manchester. I bizarrely, having left there aged one and a little bit, feel at home in Manchester, probably more than anywhere else apart from the small village that we've lived in for the last 17 years. My children tell me I'm an Essex boy because I went to school in Essex for 10 years of my life. But that's a tiny little fraction and yet that's what they say I am. All of my children were born in Southampton, where I was in, worked at a university. None of them equate with being from Southampton. One of them moved from Southampton at roughly the same age that I did. The others were older, seven was the oldest. But he has no desire to be identified as somebody from Southampton. He and his siblings are all strong Northumberland children 
and now young adults. That's their identity. That's what they believe in. It's a complex thing, identity. But of course, our three speakers are going to clarify and tell us exactly what it's all about and get it right so that we know when we leave here this evening that we, we understand what identity is. Or at least, hopefully, they will have um, provoked a few more questions about identity. And those three speakers are, and you've got more detailed notes in your packs, but Graham Bell, Director of the North of England Civic Trust, a member of the um, Heritage Alliance. Graham is also on the Council of Europe and Nostra, the Alliance's equivalent in Europe. And Graham also works, he's just about to disappear, um, on behalf of the uh, Ar architectural panel of the National Trust to um, Ireland tomorrow, or Ireland tomorrow. Isi Mohammed from the Library of Birmingham will talk about how communities and groups have an important role in shaping and reshaping their built environments and how emerging cultural heritages fuse the traditional with the new. And last but not least, Rihanna Mason, a senior lecturer in Museum, Galleries and Heritage Studies in this university's International Centre for Cultural and Heritage Studies. Rihanna's research and teaching interests focus on national museums and heritage, history, curatorship, and memory. So we've got three excellent individuals to lead us on this quest, um, and they've got about 10 or 12 minutes each to um, lead us to Laverna and its understanding exactly what heritage and identity is all about. Without further ado, I ask Graham to come to lead this discussion. Thank you. In October, three scientists were awarded a Nobel Prize for demonstrating how a phenomenon that we suspected all to be true works, that humans have an inbuilt sense of where we are. This physiological GPS is in the hippocampus, buried in the base of the brain. But of course, knowing where you are only works if you can relate it to everywhere else. So they also confirmed that the hippocampus includes navigational guidance. This autopilot explains how 84.6% of revelers on a Friday night in the big market wake up in their own beds on Saturday morning. It doesn't explain why the other 15.4% don't. The more startling revelation relevant to this debate about the hippocampus is that the scientists prove that there is an innate, an innate link between spatial awareness and memory, between being and belonging. You may choose to geotag photographs or postings on Facebook and Twitter, but your hippocampus is automatically always on, always recording the relationship between who you are, where you are, and where you've come from. So if cultural identity is the collective memory of our society, who are the people of the North East and what is it? North of England Civic Trust launched as the Civic Trust for the North East in October 1965. So next year we'll be celebrating our 50th anniversary. The launch said a lot about attitudes to, region, to the region at that time. The founders included T. Dan Smith, charismatic urban visionary, among other things. <laughs> Lord Ridley, the old mother, the establishment, traditional values. And James Steele, Washington New Town, the future of town and country planning. This was not a heritage body, but a rallying of movers and shakers set on shaping the Northeast. The headline in the journal at the time read, Dirt will be swept from the path to wealth. Not what I suspect, Tony, that you'd write now. There always was a National Civic Trust based in London, but the North East, even then, was fiercely independent, and as now, doesn't like being told what's best for us. So we did our own thing. The national body went bust in 2009, leaving NECT as the only one of its type in England, 
which in itself says something about the strength of feeling in the region, about this people and this place. The irony, though, is that you will rarely hear anyone describe themselves as Northeasterners. So who are we? That other far-flung English outpost, Cornwall, earlier this year was granted minority status by the European Union. Somehow I think we never want to class ourselves as a minority. We could resent the fact that Northeast is a relative term, not one of intrinsic identity. We relish being the furthest part of England from Westminster, the debatable lands. But are we saying that being English is more important than having our own regional identity? Some years ago, the commissioners of English heritage were in the region and asked them who and what English heritage represents. The heritage of the English, the people, or of England, the place. That was long before the split was envisaged that will come into effect next to April, when for the first time in 101 years, management of the National Heritage Collection of state-owned historic buildings will pass to a new charity that will keep the name English Heritage while the statutory planning function will be renamed Historic England. Are Lindisfarne Priory or Warkworth Castle symbols of Englishness or of Northeastness? Is Hadrian's Wall a World Heritage Site or War Heritage Site? Do these speak of an England of old, where we came from, or a vulture cultural society in the global world, the English of the here and now, our identity and values. The relationship between people and place is more apparent if we stand back a bit and look at ourselves in a wider context. In the 1930s, a, new, a newspaper headline is said to have read, Fog in the Channel, Continent Cut Off. It gave the game away that really we measure the world from our island home. We are intuitively, and some would say stubbornly, parochial. Most people still think of Europe as being over there, another place. So presumably no one here thinks of yourself as being European. Is that why when Mr. Barroso sends Mr. Cameron a postcard from Brussels with a nice picture of the Atomium on one side and on the other a message saying, wish you were here, running short of cash, please send 1.7 billion by return, the response is not quite one of the family rallying round in times of need. Yet Britain is held in high esteem across Europe as an exemplar for cultural heritage, how it's valued in our society, and how we cherish our distinctive identity. Europa Nostra has members in almost every European country, but Britain was instrumental in its inception over 50 years ago. Does Europe's admiration for a UK culturally-based identity become foggy once outsiders try to look more closely at our regions? Is England big enough and diverse enough to have regional identities? Some years ago I set up a foundation in Hungary based on NECT. Currently I'm doing some research at the Institute for Social and European Studies into the relationship between cultural identity and Europe's nation states which is particularly relevant for the UK and Hungary, both of which sometimes play on being at the margins of Europe. As the general election of 2015 nears, we use our should we, shouldn't we card to taunt the EU about whether we're in or out, whether the drawbridge across the channel is up or down. Hungary is doing the same, whether to look west to the European Union or east to its former so-called mentor, Russia. Hungary's cultural identity rests on its language and currency, except that neither are used anywhere other than by Hungarians. It risks being marginalised by its own uniqueness. Is this a card the UK could play once too often? The UK is at least the home of a global language, if no longer an empire, even if Geordies can't be understood in Chelsea, never mind the Czech Republic. Tony Henderson, in his article about this event, asked if we are tribal in football or in life, and for some people, obviously, those two are the same thing. 
Regional dialect, as the oral territory of communities, is largely now confined to archives or dramas such as the Pittman Painters. Interesting, but something rarely not now used in daily life. Regional accents survive, and in the media are considered to bring colour to diction. But in a world of peripatetic workforces, these also have faded. In only three generations, neighbourhood communities, as our extended families, have been supplanted by the virtual environment and connections of social media. In other words, place less relationships. Mind you, the record of real people place relationships isn't always exemplary. I've mentioned that few people would consider themselves Northeasterners. But have you realised that this year is the 40th anniversary of the creation of Tiny Weir as a county? As far as I can see, Tiny Weir Metropolitan Fire Brigade are the only celebrants. How many of you will be putting a commemorative mug in someone's stocking this Christmas? Or perhaps your New Year resolution is to see that chapter in our history undone and what you might consider to be the artificial overlay of purely administrative boundaries erased. 200 years ago, the Council of Vienna met in the wake of Napoleon's defeat to carve up Europe into nation states. Trianon and Yalta had similar aims, leaving a mismatch across Europe where the homelands of nations, peoples with a, peoples with a common uh, ethnic identity, no longer aligned with state boundaries, places with a common governance. In the lead into the Scottish referendum, Tom Shakespeare, who for a while was based in this region, suggested the nation state had run its course and we should revert to smaller socio economic units that would re establish a better fit between people and place, and which for England would return us to the Anglo Saxon kingdoms. That would mean we, here tonight, would no longer be meeting in something wishy washily entitled the northeast of something but in Northumbria, a real place with real identity and real people. We would still be part of a nation, but how shall I put this, we'd no longer be in the state we're in. Now doesn't that bring in a better ring about it? So in best reader tradition, if I can purloin and translate something David Steele famously once said, go back to your homeland and prepare for cultural revolution. Thank you very much. I've asked the three speakers to speak all um, in a row and then we'll open the floor to questions and discussion um, as we go on. Thank you. <clears throat> um, good evening, everybody. <clears throat> right. Um, in the run-up to this, I was asked by um, Kate of the Heritage Alliance to, to reflect upon uh, my experiences and, I guess, work uh, within the city of Birmingham uh, and to draw upon the context, the multicultural urban context of Birmingham to help us reflect possibly more broadly and extrapolate more broadly about context of the nation as a whole, maybe opportunities or circumstances in Newcastle. Naturally, I couldn't necessarily talk in detail about Newcastle because I don't have too much expertise about the different projects and programs here, but my work particularly around engagement, cultural engagement and participation uh, through um, heritage has um, allowed me to have quite a useful overview of the different communities and the different programs and projects in Birmingham, so I'll try and reflect upon that. Um, Britain is now said to be made up of diverse communities and cultures. We now describe our society and its respective cities, towns and localities as being multicultural. And by saying that, we also refer to, I guess, largely some of the migration uh, that's taken place in the post-war era. Um, I was asked to also think uh, particularly about um, the more longer established groups that have been um, arriving and settling in, uh, in Birmingham, but also uh, nationally. So we are talking about groups from the Caribbean and from the Indian subcontinent and also their descendants. There's a, a distinction to be made here between those that were migrants and arrived as migrants and of course those their descendants, a very different set of experiences. The communities and groups that comprise that diversity have had, through time, an important role in shaping and reshaping 
their built environments, compelling us to rethink, too, our historic environments. This particularly in regards to the lives, stories, and experiences that populate certain areas and that constitute the now, the respective emergent cultural heritages that fuse the traditional, so to speak, with the new and the rapidly changing, and in terms of ideas around sense of place and belonging, towards perhaps a notion um, of social and cultural inclusion and even on towards integration itself. The, this brief presentation will cover four sites of projects within Birmingham and that are situated within around parts of Birmingham. Uh, in the engagement of groups and the representation of diverse cultural heritages and identities, each has attempted to address issues by trying to understand the challenges present, presented by specific contexts by thinking about possible opportunities therein, by accepting their own limitations, and by being open to dialogue and learn. The four sites or projects I want to talk about are Aston Hall in Birmingham, some of you may know it, um, the National Trust Back to Backs, Cannon Street Memorial Baptist Church and their oral history project, and SAMPAD, um, who are an arts organization who do work primarily around the South Asian community and their project, called the My Root Project. So to begin with, Aston Hall is a grade one listed Jacobean house in Aston, Birmingham, England, designed by John Thorpe, built between 1618 and 1635. In 1864, the house was bought by the Birmingham Corporation, becoming the first historic country house to pass into municipal ownership. It is still owned by Birmingham City Council, it is now a community museum managed by the Birmingham Museums Trust and is open to the public during the summer months uh, after a major renovation was completed in 2009. Their website explains, Aston Hall is one of Birmingham's uh, most treasured buildings. We displayed as part of, the of, a, as part of a development project, Aston Hall boasts sumptuous interiors from the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries including the magnificent long gallery, display rooms illustrate the part Aston Hall and its residents played in key moments in history, including the English Civil War, and how it prepared to receive royalty on more than one occasion. Um, that's quite an interesting description. What we have, though, in the area of Aston now is a, a very diverse community that has changed over time, and that diversity, to some extent, has increased and so that has presented a number of different challenges for the site and the, the professionals and practitioners that are there at that site and more broadly within the Museums Trust to think about how they can make that site, that building more relevant um, to the local community uh, in the area, how they can make the cultural fabric of the city through that building more relevant and resonate for those groups. There are efforts made by the team at Aston Hall to engage with the local community but very, with varying degrees of success even with targeted projects and programs, the task of engaging diverse communities residing in the area, residing in the area has been difficult. Um, I myself have had the chance to provide some support um, and deliver some workshops and activities in the area. Um, and um, the work has been ongoing for the site and the venue, um, again, with varied success. Um, one of the things has been that um, and you'll see this contrast with some of the other venues and some of the other projects that I talk about, is to what degree is that site able to build in to the lived life of those local communities? Um, the, the kind of, well, rather put another way, how can that site or venue be a part of the everyday life of those groups that now reside in the area, in other words? So you have this fantastic building, this uh, historic country house, and you have all these diverse groups. In what ways can the building and the history that it represents become relevant? And we know about a lot of the stately homes that, that are up and down the country, and we know the ways in which we now can think about the historical layers of those buildings and the textures, and how, particularly in the context of empire and various aspects of empire, we've been able to make those stately homes relevant to some degree or other. But it's interesting that I think that we haven't, rather the site there is still struggling to engage with the local community and to find a way of being ever present in their lives, even though this building stands quite clear and visible in that locality. So, the next um, project, or rather a, a place that I'll talk about, is the National Trust Back-to-Backs. The Birmingham Back-to-Backs are preserved examples of the thousands of similar houses that were built literally back-to-back -back around courtyards. 
This is this as a response to the rapidly increasing population of Britain's uh, expanding industrial towns. The Birmingham back-to-backs capture the reality of industrial and urban living through time. The National Trust website describes an atmospheric glimpse into the lives of the ordinary people who helped make Birmingham an extraordinary city. On a fascinating guided tour, step back in time at Birmingham's last surviving back-to-backs, um, houses built literally back-to-back -back around a communal courtyard. Moving from the 1840s through to the 1970s, discover the lives of some of the former residents who, crammed into these, who were crammed into these small houses to live and work, with fires alight in the grates and sounds and smells from the past, experiences, or rather experiencing a provocative, uh, intimate insight into life at the back to back. The narrative comprising the tour incorporates three periods from which human stories are drawn. In the latter third period, the story incorporates the multicultural change within the city by telling the story of a Caribbean tailor that once lived at that very same property. Such slum conditions were for some period a common experience for a significant proportion of the Birmingham population. But these were also conditions that were encountered and experienced by migrants as they arrived into the city. Indeed, it is common, under, commonly understood that slum areas were the portals of entry for migrants. In many instances, these were the kinds of areas in which they settled and made home for some period. The naturally converging experience of living in these sorts of housing conditions has enabled a historic environment and a multicultural urban context to be interwoven meaningfully, in this context at least. This has enabled the site through a tour delivered on site in which there was significant attention paid to the life of that Caribbean table um, who actually lodged there. Um, to be readily accessible, or rather that site, as a result of that story, to be readily accessible to people of varied cultural backgrounds, many understanding and being inspired by its history and its wider and social and cultural resonances. I'll now talk about the SAMPAD project. SAMPAD, an arts organisation in Birmingham, uh, was recently successful in securing funding from the Heritage Lottery Fund for an exciting new community project called My Route. Now, the idea behind My Route is that there is a particular bus route, a well-established, well-used bus route within the city, one of the busiest, and it goes through a particular uh, artery within the city, leading out of the city through some residential areas and some um, say residential areas and, and some sort of throughways and thoroughfares, thoroughfares, local areas where there's a lot of shops, restaurants and cafes. The project is described on the Sandpad website as such. My, my route aims to capture, share, and preserve the vibrant and culturally rich heritage that exists between Sparkbrook, an area in Birmingham, and Horbury along Stratford Road. This is the road in which the bus um, winds its way, and the surrounding areas. Over the last 60 years, this road has welcomed many new residents from across the globe, whose lives and experiences have created a diverse and colourful tale that deserves to be acknowledged. Changes to buildings, languages, and peoples and people, however, are occurring at an increasing rate, making it an essential, making it essential that, her that the heritage is recorded before it is lost. So we're talking here about transition and things happening very quickly and changing very quickly, right before our eyes. Sampa has therefore developed a program of creative activity that, which will allow us to find, record and share this heritage with a focus on the following topics, demographics, religion, trade, language, food and architecture. Working with the local community between Sparkbrook and Hogre, the project will identify how the people, landscape and culture has changed and, and developed with the settlement and migration of new populations around the world. Working in partnership with Birmingham Archives, my group will train volunteers on heritage research skills using oral histories, factual data collection and public donations to uncover the unique history of the world. The last the um, example that I wish to draw uh, upon is um, the Cannon Street Memorial Baptist Church. Uh, the Cannon Street Memorial Baptist Church is located in an area called Handwerk, an area in Birmingham often described as very diverse, where once the church was comprised of an indigenous British congregation, and this for much of its existence, it is now, as a result of that migration and change, described as a black-led church. Handsworth as an area has always been a portal to the migrants. It remains home to their descendants and to newer groups now. The church congregation is in due course has begun to absorb that demographic change.
We know that religion is an essential aspect of everyday life for many groups, and the members of groups who would remain largely interested would look to continue their way of life wherever they find themselves. So while the physical building had remained largely untouched, those finding significance inside had become culturally different to those who had founded the church in the earlier era, if they were, even if they were to a large extent religiously similar. It should be mentioned that this particular change of transition was not easy for many concerned. Critically, the church, as it is now, had recognised that the elder ranks of its congregation were thinning out. And these were some of the earlier migrants who had come into the city and had started to join the congregation to find a way of um, um, fulfilling their faith and religion. The church acknowledged that those uh, with the memories and stories of that earlier period of settlement um, were passing on, basically, as mentioned, the numbers are thinning out. Responding to this issue, the church developed and delivered an oral history project between 2005 and 2007. The project was um, funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund. The Cannon Street Memorial Baptist Church uh, oral history project in total collected over 100 oral testimonies. These are now with the archives department at the Library of Birmingham. This collection of oral histories is, a very, is very important for showing how migration and social change can be woven into the historic and the built environment of a particular locality. The church, while reference, referencing simultaneously the multicultural urban concept of an area of Hansworth. So, to conclude, I guess um, what I've tried to reflect upon there through that range of projects and locations is um, the different ways in which uh, an urban context will have changed and flowed through time, particularly through migration, and how either localities or the usages or the utility of particular localities might change or be reshaped by those groups in those areas. Um, Aston Hall, for example, um, has uh, is a heritage site. It remains a heritage site. Its, its usage isn't in the sense of an everyday place like the church, for example or like, for example, the migrant project which documents and records the change that has happened along that road all the way up that route. So the ways in which, for example, barbers have changed into now cafes, into then restaurants, or even that barbers have remained the same, changed hands from um, initially British to then Italian and then to Caribbean. So there's all these different changes taking place. And until more recently, we haven't been uh, able to, or rather we haven't realised the, the importance of those changes and that transition through time and the importance of documenting and recording that. Because before you know it, the stories have disappeared and gone. Um, one of the things that I wanted us to reflect upon uh, at the end there is um, the, I guess, the, the connections between, and even the tensions between cultural heritage and social history. So when we're talking about these diverse groups and recording and documenting their presences in a physical built environment, to understand that, we need to make sense of it through something like social history, we might record their stories. But set against that is the idea of cultural heritage, which although theoretically might have um, ideas of change and fluidity built in at a theoretical level again, an academic, the way that we popularly, popularly understand it um, is in terms of being quite fixed and unchanging. So that sits in contrast, interestingly for me at least, uh, with the idea of social history, which is that here we're recording change and change through time. And on the other hand, we've got cultural heritage, which relates to things that we essentialize and keep almost fixed in our minds, these ideals about the past and the ways in which we try to kind of stay true to them. So it was on that note really that I wanted to, to bring an end to the talk. So thank you. Izzy, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. So good evening everybody. It's a real pleasure to be asked to contribute to this debate this evening. So Kate asked me to sketch out uh, key ideas in current academic thinking about heritage and identity, and also to think about how people relate to heritage in terms of their personal identity.
10 minutes, that's um, quite a challenge, uh, but I've accepted it, so I'll, I'll do my best. With this in mind, I want to begin with an object. And that object is a pair of scissors, a tailor's scissors dating from the mid-1900s. These scissors can be found today in the Discovery Museum in the west end of Newcastle in a display called Destination Tyneside. And this display tells the histories of the people who moved to Tyneside from the 1940s to today. It tells of their contribution to this area's industrial success, which is a key part of the region's history and a source of local pride and identity. These scissors belonged to David Reiner, the son of Lena and Louis Weinberg, who were living in the West End at the time of the 1881 census. In the museum's display, we meet Lena, brought to life by an actress in a film. Lena and her husband, we discover, were Jewish and came to Newcastle in 1874 from Poland to escape persecution and to find a better life. Lena explains how they found work here as shoemakers and how they came to feel at home in Newcastle although they kept their Jewish traditions, like celebrating the Sabbath. Her children stayed in the region, and one of her sons became a tailor, later changing his surname to make it more English-sounding, Weinberg to Weiner. Lena speaks of feeling welcomed locally, but also tells how at a national level concerns were being raised by politicians and the media about too many migrants coming to the UK, especially Jewish ones. The film ends with a poster about the Aliens Act of 1905, which restricted the number of Eastern European settlers allowed into the UK. Under this act, those who were unable to prove they could support themselves could be refused entry. The Weinberg's migration story is one among many represented in the museum's display. As in many parts of the UK, industrial expansion during the 19th century and high wages attracted people from far and wide. People flocked to the northeast from Wales, Cornwall, Ireland, Cumbria, Lancashire, as well as Poland, Italy, and the Yemen, amongst other places. The display tells us that by 1900, about 2,000 Jewish people were living in Newcastle's West End. By 1911, 6% of the total population was Scottish and Irish, and 37% of the population overall in the North East had been born outside of England or were the children of migrants. The reason I've chosen to begin with this example tonight is because it encapsulates many important issues relating to heritage and identity. Heritage can be extremely personal. Something as ordinary as a pair of scissors can be a prized family possession passed down through the generations with the story of what it meant to that family. Objects work as symbols, they act as cues and evidence for stories about what individual people have experienced in their lifetime. So heritage is about as much about the meanings and the stories in the present, the intangible aspect, as about the tangible remains of the past. When put into a formal heritage context in a museum, that personal heritage takes on a collective resonance and is given special status as officially recognised heritage. In this case, the scissors become emblematic of the story of 19th and 20th century European history. In particular, how Jewish people, amongst others, have been persecuted for their heritage and identity across generations. In turn, we are reminded how the histories and heritages of different localities, nations and ethnicities are linked together through migration stories and shared events like the two world wars. So on the one hand, this is a story about one family, but at the same time, it is about our shared history. This example reminds us too that while we sometimes speak about the local, national and global as though they were different and separate spheres, in actuality they are always connected and influencing one another. So this display is important in that it connects the 19th and early 20th century history of Tyneside to contemporary stories of migration and diversity in the North East. A wall towards the end of the display asks people to share their reasons for settling in the North East more recently, and the display also invites us to put ourselves in the shoes of others. We are asked to imagine, what would it be like if we had to leave the place we call home and start anew? An interactive display for children asks them to imagine packing a suitcase. 
You can't take everything with you. So which precious objects will you put in your suitcase, it asks. In conjunction with the display, the museum's learning staff work with children in local schools to explore issues of migration and identity. Displays of local history, such as this one, show us that notions of heritage and identity are always on the move. They do not stay the same. The identity of the North East has changed each time migrants have brought their own practices, traditions, food, music, dialect, and so on. So we should not speak of identity and heritage, but identities and heritages. In both cases, these concepts are multifaceted. Your identity, like your heritage, can be understood in terms of religion, ethnicity, gender, age, locality, nationality, sexuality, and so on. And these facets are linked and intersecting. Some of them come to the fore at certain times, and others may move into the background, depending on the context. Sometimes you support, support your local football team, and sometimes the national. Another key aspect of both heritage and identity is what is often called sense of place. Now this is defined in many different ways in the literature, but put simply, we can understand it to refer to both place distinctiveness, what makes a place identifiable and different, and also, also to our emotional relationships with that place and the people within it, how we feel about it, what it means to us, and how we inhabit it. This is where heritage in the sense of the built and natural environment plays a significant role. We all have our own ways of inhabiting a place, the shortcuts we take, the places we like to go, the places we avoid. But there will be a shared experience of being in place as we interact with many of the same spaces and landmarks as other people who share that place. The built and natural environment then acts as the setting for our lives, experiences and memories. They serve as shared points of reference, and over time, the more iconic landmarks become invested with symbolic power, in some cases becoming designated as a group's heritage. For example, through repeated referencing the bridges, the bridges over the River Tyne have come to stand in for Newcastle and Gateshead, and thus heritage becomes visual shorthand for expressing local identity, in this case what it means to be a Geordie. All groups require symbols in order to define their shared identity and to communicate it both to themselves and to others. Recognising uh, recognition of those symbols is part of the process of identifying whether you belong to a group and share its identity or not. A sense of place is also linked to the idea of place attachment. Feeling strongly and positively attached and connected to a place is an important aspect of pe people's identity. People often feel strongly attached to places which have been formative in their lives, where they grew up, or where they experienced major life events which feature strongly in their sense of identity. And I'm using identity here to mean the narrative people construct to explain who they are to themselves and others, and to make sense of their experiences and values. This positive attachment to place is often described as a sense of belonging, feeling at home, Importantly, a sense of belonging does not always have to match up to identity positions. Again, these things are linked and overlapping, but may not always be identical. I would describe myself as Welsh, British and European, but I would say I feel most at home here in Newcastle. So as a newcomer, you can develop a sense of belonging over time through your lived experience of that place, so long as you do not find yourself actively excluded by others on the basis of your identity and heritage. In contemporary society, many com commentators observe that some of the traditional collective structures which previously supported people's identities, for example religion, class, national identity and employment status, that these are weakening because of societal changes like globalisation, secularisation and deindustrialization. It is argued that people increasingly seek other means of securing a more individualistic sense of self, including reference to heritage and more locally defined place-based identities. Hence the recent explosion, it is argued, of public interest in local heritage, popular history and genealogy. This presents an opportunity for the heritage sector, I would suggest, especially for those organisations which address questions of identity through their collections, sites and displays. 
there is an enormous potential here to engage with this interest and to be part of the debates that society is having around questions of identity, diversity, migration, globalisation, Europe and so on. Take the recent Scottish referendum, for example, 84.5% voter turnout in Scotland and in the rest of the UK, the media came alive with people arguing about what were frequently questions of heritage and national identity. Moreover, we saw 16 to 24 year olds, the hard to reach museum and heritage audience, passionately engaging with questions of history, politics and identity. I wonder how many museums or heritage organisations engaged with the Scottish referendum issue, or these young people. Surely this was a golden opportunity to have helped the British public reflect both on the historical roots of the United Kingdom and the Union, which was hanging in the balance. In my view, museums and heritage organisations are some of the few spaces in our society where we could have these kinds of public conversations. Yes, newspapers are a vehicle for such discussion, as is the formal political system, but these channels are often seen as partisan, fail to reach many. While I would not say that a museum or a heritage site is a neutral space, they are public spaces where different perspectives on contemporary issues could be brought together within a historical frame to provide some perspective on how societies have dealt with similar issues in the past. Through public programming, outreach and learning activities in particular, I think there is an untapped potential, uh, untapped opportunity here to connect with current concerns in a way that will give heritage organisations new significance and status in the public sphere. Some are already doing this kind of work, as we've seen in the Discovery Museum's Destination Tyneside. But I suggest to you that it is the right time for the heritage sector as a whole to recognise this opportunity and to embrace it. Thank you. very much for those contributions. Um, it's now time to turn the discussion to yourselves. Um, my plan is to collect two or three questions together and then ask the, the three members of the panel to comment and, uh, and answer if necessary those questions or if, if relevant to answer those questions. So um, we've got two roaming microphones um, that will come round if you uh, if you wave your hand in the air, and if we could uh, could start the process, would anybody like to ask the first question? We've got somebody down here and somebody there, so we'll start with this one and then bring the second mic to here. Yes, madam. Hello, Sarah. Um, I want to ask about nostalgia, which I think is quite an important motivation. Probably all of you know, um, what their view of nostalgia is and how you can um, create a sense of nostalgia if you do doesn't have a natural memory. Okay, thank you. So, I'm not sure that the members of the panel have any view on whether there's a good distinction to be made here between natural and built heritage. I'm thinking of the way in which architectural styles can travel in something like the way things like language and things can. On the other hand, there is only one time cycle, there's only one bit of time in the world. But it seems there might be a distinction between the group, maybe I don't know if there are any thoughts on that. Okay, thank you very much. Have we got a third question at the moment? I'll see with a light surprise. So down right in the front. Sorry. That's pretty dark. Yes, sir. I mean, you have such a diverse range of view, actually, put forward already. Um, I mean, I was interested, you were talking about your allegiance, Professor Stone, to Manchester, which I have an allegiance to through my father. Graham Bell asked if, you know, parts of the Northumbrian heritage, I think you mentioned the wall in particular, were England's heritage or war heritage. Um, Issy was talking about identifying a Caribbean tailor in the back-to-backs, particularly to perhaps engage an immigrant audience. 
and uh, Dr. Mason was talking about how very personal heritage is and about the different and overlapping identities that she herself has. And I, pulling out of this, thought there were a number of things that I wanted you to sort of perhaps think about a bit more. To what extent do you think it's more important perhaps to know and identify yourself with one key heritage? Should we worry about whether we are English, Scottish, Welsh? Or is it more important to recognise and celebrate the whole variety of things from which we come? And that perhaps leads me on to the key point, my key question, which is actually, do you have to identify at all with something? to find it interesting. Okay, thank you very much. So we've got three questions there, and um, while we're, I'm asking the panel to, to comment and, uh, and discuss those, if you can think about the next three questions, then we can move, move on as soon as we, we've got that. So, I'm gonna take it in the same order as, um, as you spoke, which gives Graham the short straw of starting off, um, but three questions there. Nostalgia, place, and global to first born and back. If I can refer to um, Hungary, uh, which I think is an, an interesting context for the discussion about what we're looking at here in England. Um, of course, Hungary uh, came out on the wrong side in two world wars. They then experienced uh, a considerable period, a generation really, uh, under communism. And probably about six weeks ago, uh, I was uh, fortunate to have a tea with uh, a count and countess who were the only couple who still live in the original house, the country house in Hungary. So here we have a historic houses association. We have a long established sense of national heritage linked to places. And here we have a country where that connection that disconnection exists. And the country houses have no contents because all of that was purloined um, at different stages, so the, the historic houses are just simply gaunt shells. And I think it's made me realize that here the value of identity is about continuity. Um, we have a very valuable um, opportunity here to be able to see heritage as being a continuous process. It might have been progressive, it might have had some major events and some gaps, but largely it's continuity. And I think one of the themes for me that's interesting from the three presentations is about the, the, uh, the intangible. Um, for Hungary, um, heritage is not so much about the physical, because in a sense it's been stripped of a lot of its physical heritage. It's about the intangible. It's about the relationships, the symbolism. And I think that, for me, coming back to this country, is something that, in terms of the Discovery Museum and how you know, a pair of scissors really brings the sense of identity down to something touchable, very physical, very understandable, at all age groups and on all levels. So that's something I think we can do more about. And you might have a sense that uh, it's a bit of a meaningless debate whether it's Englishness or Northeastness or something else. Um, I stopped short of referring to time and weariness because in a sense it was sort of time and weariness. Um, and you know, it, it, does it really matter? I think it is about the personal component. So we, it is about society being the, the accumulation of individual experiences and opportunities to engage with it. Okay, thank you. Is he? Yes. Um, Do okay. no. Yes. Um, the, coming from the um, right heel, the other way, um, coming from right, maybe try it one more time. On the topic of the diverse, multicultural the context that I was referring to and the range of migrant groups. Um, well, at least we're referencing that. When we talk about nostalgia, I guess what we're talking about is memory. And when we're thinking about memory and trying to think about nostalgia and looking back, um, it's fundamentally about the connections and the way that we can understand those connections. So in the case of migrant groups, um, 
there's the issue of time, I guess, and that is to what extent, or rather, how much time has um, elapsed between the thing that we're possibly trying to be nostalgic about, about and the time in which we exist, from whence we look back, uh, trying to be nostalgic. So, in other words, um, each and every moment presents itself with things that may be remembered, um, and over a given period of time we arrive at whatever moment in our lives where we look back and we reflect and we can potentially be nostalgic about these things. I think relating to the, the question of, you know, is there a single heritage that we should really be focusing on, I think, I think it's inevitable that there will always be a multiple set of heritages, we cannot avoid that because it relates fundamentally to the fact that we have a multiple set of identities contexts and situations in our lives and we identify with all of those in different ways and at different times and so that will lead us to pull these different threads out at various points and you know bring us to a state or a situation where we are nostalgic or reflect um, so for migrant groups i guess it's you know whatever that they look back upon and the challenges they may have initially overcome and the circumstances that they lived through and how they responded <coughs> to that um, it could be Anything from the local, again, as I mentioned a, a little bit ago, the um, uh, Caribbean barbers that they used to use. It could be at the local cafe that was the first place that they used to attend in their group things, um, where they'd be able to get some of their own food. It, there's a whole variety of ways, just referencing that sort of, sort of multicultural dimension of migration. And at some point, we might see a convergence. And what I mean by that is that slowly we see how some of the things that more broadly we value or society, British society values as heritage, um, the, the migrant groups that have settled, how they start to see some of that feed into the thread of their own lives and start to see that as being important to them too. But wrapped into that is, of course, the, the narrative of their own lives and their own experiences. So the whole nostalgia thing is quite an interesting thing. And I think for a lot of groups that's still playing itself out because they've not necessarily been here long enough. But there are, at the same time, things that they look back upon that have, you know, uh, significance in their lives. Thank you. We have a Okay. Is that working okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, to take the first question then, nostalgia. For me, nostalgia would be a, an emotional longing for perhaps a place lost or a sense of home um, lost to you. It's an interesting question, isn't it? Um, how, how do you connect people with ideas like that when they're coming from, from different backgrounds, when they perhaps don't have that shared common collective memory? And I think this is a question which is facing a lot of um, museums and heritage, heritage organisations now. You know, who are the we that they are addressing when they say, this is part of our heritage, we, whatever. You know, we remember the, the, the First World War. Who are the we? Um, so I think what you see in a number of places where, where they've already been dealing with multicultural societies actively in museums, for example, for a long time, say in, in Australia or, or Canada and so on, is that people look for quite personal routes in for visitors. So they talk about things like moving, like home, like belonging, things actually which cut across, they're quite universal concepts, but then people can relate to them in their own way. So I would suggest that that is a strategy which, which I have seen, um, you know, observed that, that uh, various museums certainly are adopting to try and bridge the gap between different communities and their, their diversities. Um, on the question of natural and built heritage and the distinction, uh, we did a project, myself and, and, uh, and some colleagues here at the university, uh, around people's um, sort of sense of visual heritage of the region. So this was for a redevelopment of the Lane Art Gallery here in the city, um, a redisplay of their permanent collection of art art in the northeast uh, for the last 300 years. And what was striking that we talked to a lot of people um, over a two-year period about how they understood Newcastle, how they related to the collections. And they didn't really distinguish between natural and built in any sort of <coughs> systematic way. It was a real mixture of things. So you would say to them, what's important to you in the region? What do you think of? And, they would, and what are your memories of it? And they would, they would come up with the bridges, and then the quayside and the river, and then the coast, 
and walking on the coast with their family. So it's, it's a very sort of seamless, fluid, interconnecting, I would say, of these things together. Some of those things are designated as heritage in the official sense, but some of them are not. And that's the other point to, to sort of put across is that it's, it's important for us when we're trying to think about this, not to prejudge how people will define heritage or what they will attribute importance to. I think we have to, we have to ask people if we want to know the answer to a question like that. But in my experience, it's sort of quite a seamless, seamless blend. Um, and boundaries, the question about categories and so on. Do you have to identify with something to find it interesting? Uh, it, it depends what you mean by identify, because I think there's different ways to identify. You can identify in terms of, well, you know, in terms of a sort of reflective, a, a reflection. So, I'm, I come from South Wales, and I see a display about South Wales, and I feel a connection. But you can also, I think, identify through sort of analogy. So, I went to the um, Museum of the History of Catalonia recently, and actually looking around that display made me think more about growing up in Wales than other displays I've seen about Wales, if that makes sense, because there were parallels, there were commonalities. And sometimes it's that thing of, of, of looking at, at uh, an issue from another side, from an outsider's perspective, that triggers responses you wouldn't expect. So I think identifying and identity are related, but they're not the same. They're not the same. They don't have to match up in a sort of symmetrical way. Um, do you need to identify with a single identity or a multiple identity? Well, I would say, like, like Izzy, it's inevitable, I think, that people have a connection to multiple identities. They're always overlapping, they're always intersecting, they're always multiple. Um, having said that, some matter more than others in some contexts. So, in the Scottish referendum, <coughs> national identity came to the fore, and that was the key thing people were talking about. Although there will have been other identities, sort of, and nested in, in that uh, sense of identity or connected to it. I think it certainly matters if you're excluded. Then it really matters whether you can belong to the dominant group or not, um, because often you'll be ex exclude, excluded by other people. So it's that question of you may wish to belong, but you may be denied that opportunity. So there I think it is, it is crucial. But ideally, I'd like people to identify in as many ways as possible, because I think that's the way to encourage people to understand each other across, across divisions like ethnicity and religion and so on, and to see what we have in common. No, absolutely. Um, I mean, one sort of final uh, note, just to, in a way, try and pick some of those, or pull some of those together. One of the things that we've all been talking about is the identification of identity, or the self-identification of identity, what I feel is important. But as I mentioned at, at the beginning, there is also the view of other people's version of identity, and the danger comes when identity is um, imposed or created by a large group um, or a dominant group for everybody else either to be included into or officially excluded from. Um, and there are countless examples of that. We, one of the obvious ones is um, the 1930s and 40s in the National Socialist Party in Germany. Um, and one of the little known units in the SS was their archaeological and anthropological division, um, which um, arrived in town immediately following the Panzers um, and reinterpreted the European past as it should have been reinterpreted, correctly of course, um, as it had been badly interpreted by the Poles or the Czechs or whoever they had just rolled over. Um, and so it's the danger of the lack of multiple identities is a uniform identity imposed on us. Um, and I think that's a, a, an issue to always keep in the back of one's mind. Anyway, do we have three more questions? Lady at the front. Yeah. Um, thank you for your interesting presentations. Mr. Mohammed referred to the marginality by uniqueness. I would like to raise the question of intangible heritage to which you've um, accorded importance. And to raise 
what you think academia and umbrella bodies and individual organisations can do to seek to persuade our government to consider signing the Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage. You've all referred to the intangible. It's something of the soul and spirit of place and people, and I just wish we could get it signed. Thank you. <coughs> yes. Hi. The heritage is more often associated with the past, and what we have from the past is just a fraction of what existed in those times, um, particularly uh, personal stories and personal memories. We are left with just what the articulate left us. Whereas today, we have such an excess of recording of images, and the ability to capture stories and memories and so on. So I would suggest there is a challenge for the heritage industry to be aware of the sheer volumes that we now have and um, the using of the, uh, the appropriate technologies to really um, capture a lot of this for, for the future. Okay, thank you. And one other? Yes. Um. Uh, when we talk about um, heritage, do we really mean tribal? Tribal in the sense of national, uh, in the sense of regional, and even interregional with the time we are rivalry. Uh, is tribalism and territory and defensive territory hardwired into humans? And is heritage a socially acceptable, polite way of saying, this is us, this is our tribe? And if it is, what are the ramifications of this? All right, thank you very much. I think it's only fair to keep the same order, but I suppose while you're thinking about it, Graham, um, just the, to answer, well, not to answer, but to, to comment on the first question, how on earth do we get um, Her Majesty's Government to, to um, ratify the Intangible Cultural Heritage Convention? Um, uh, yeah, question or well, answers on a postcard, please. Um, they haven't even agreed to sign that convention. I've been trying for the past 12 years to get the UK to ratify the 1954 Hague Convention on the Protection of Cultural Property in the Event of Armed Conflict. And we, we, sorry, we signed that in 1954. Um, we still haven't got around to ratifying it and passing it into law, um, despite the fact that the UK government um, promised to do so in 2004, that it passed select committee in 2008, and we still haven't got round to doing it. So. Uh, how you pressurise Her Majesty's government um, and its members, goodness only knows. <coughs> Graham, that's given you enough time to think. <laughs> um, the marginality one, I think, is, is fascinating. Again, one of the themes that came out of the presentations was about um, the more transient nature of society now. And I was just thinking about how few people will live their entire life in one place or one area and will have a job for life in terms of their working experience. And therefore, with society being more mobile, how do you track the heritage or the traditions that emerge from generally a more mobile society? And that's where, to me, the intangible heritage rises on the agenda. <coughs> the connection between place and traditions and heritage is less bound than it had been in the past. And in some ways that picks up the other question about uh, the legacy of heritage that we've inherited because um, we're probably living in an age now where the problem is not whether something is going to be preserved, but that we've got such a volume of um, archives, records, and it's actually finding things and to being able to edit or to prioritise things. So I think there is more opportunity for the intangible and for the, um, in a sense, accessing what might be described as the ordinary man or the sort of, you know, not the sort of headline heritage. Uh, more opportunity now than there's, there's ever been. Um, coming back to Tony's point about um, tribalism, in a sense, 
is that something that we're going to lose because if populations are more migrant, more uh, on the move, you know, one of the points I was making is that in a sense we don't have the strength of place-based community that we did even three generations ago. So um, does tribal still count? Uh, are we becoming more a nation or indeed a society of individuals? I think that's an interesting thing that within the museum sector, as well as broadly, more broadly within heritage, is, is just a fascinating question rather than an answer. Is it? Thank you, um, some really interesting questions. Um, the, the idea of intangible cultural heritage, uh, well, that was part of a, an event not long ago where we discussed some of these themes. Um, for migrant groups in particular, going back to the talk in the context I was talking about earlier, um, that is a particular place um, when we are talking about some of them, or many of them arriving, not having brought with them too much by way of material culture. So that's the physical things that we know of. Um, and so trying to, and, and also the fact that they um, have a very shorter time wherever they've managed to arrive and settle in. And they were possibly, likely, not the people that built some of these buildings and the houses and the shops that they're running or living in. So. Naturally, in what ways do we begin to understand how we can document their presences and, and get them to feel part of where they are uh, and part of the wider society or part of the locality or region? And then tangible cultural heritage is really important in that regard, which is that what we see is that that convergence taking place, and then um, building their communities and the stories around how they did that, the stories around their migration and movement, um, the ways in which their cultural traits traditions and ideas, their cuisines or whatever it may be, come to become embedded in those localities and then filter out. So there are lots of ways in which we can see how aspects of their lives and their cultures have become very normal and part of British culture. The obvious things are to do with cuisine, for example. It's obviously a very obvious uh, reference, but so there are ways in which we can see how they have come to embed themselves and settle and the ways in which that, that they have managed to influence too the wider society with some of their traditions and, and cultures as well as being influenced by. The degree to which these groups have been influenced too is sometimes underplayed. And I think referring back to the whole thing about social integration and cohesion, there's a lot more that's happened than, than is readily understood or that we're made aware of. A lot of cultural exchange and a lot of change that's taken place. So I think intangible cultural heritage is actually quite a, an important thing in trying to help us to understand that. Something else that came up in the recent conference on the topic was that why, for some, for some societies in the world, there isn't a distinction between inter intangible cultural heritage and the physical thing. They are one and the same. And if we think about the physical things, what value are they if they don't come with intangible cultural heritage? That is the meanings and the ideas and the values that, that, that underpin them. Without those, they mean nothing. You know, what is a building? What is this item that we have? What are these things if they're not you know, if they don't come with all the ideas that they're meant to come with, they're not valuable or they're not heritage at all. So it's an interesting question, that one, about that. And then the thing about tribalism and heritage, I think the last, what I will say, what I, what took me by surprise um, recently when I did some research uh, on the census, the 2011 census, and learning about the Birmingham situation, was that, um, or rather the national situation, that possibly the largest, if not, you know, if not the largest, then the second largest um, group by way of increase proportionately since the earlier 2001 census to 2011 was the mixed category. Okay, so we're talking about ethnicity. And, well, what does that mean then? Well, if this is the largest, fastest growing group of people within a society, then what are the implications? For society as a you know as a whole, but particularly for them in terms of what's valuable and important to them. But what we're observing are different cultures coming together, and then they having to carry forward through time and in their lives these this this multiplicity, this kind of convergence of different cultures. And we can only see that escalating, or rather expanding more and more. You know, and just as a, on a personal level, my wife is Swedish, is European Swedish, and there's this sort of thing happening all the time. So. 
You know, it makes me think, for example, looking forward, you know, what, where will we be in 50 years or 70 years time, or to what extent will there be that, this kind of mixing, really? And then what does that mean for tribalism? So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Yes, I would agree with, with everything that the, the speakers before me have said about the intangible. It's, it's enormously important, essential. Um, how do we persuade the powers that be to, to take it to the next level? I think Peter has already <laughs> said you know, that it's not an easy, easy thing, but uh, I guess we keep promoting the importance of it through projects, through highlighting them, through stressing the, the value they have to, to communities and to, to um, groups, and hopefully <laughs> Hopefully it might, it might uh, make a difference longer term. On the second one, heritage and the proliferation of um, our ability to record memories and experiences and so on now. Yes, absolutely, this is a key issue, isn't it? Um, we're, we're sort of inundated now by this ability to capture everything that's happening all the time. Um, and people, I, I was intrigued to see that the there's been talk about the right to be forgotten, so actually <laughs> we're dealing with the other problem now, aren't we? How do we, how do we try and say maybe we don't want to record everything? Um, and again, I think, I, I, I mentioned in my talk about the potential for, for museums and heritage organisations, and I actually think here again there's a real role for museums and heritage organisations, because along with the proliferation, I think there's an increasing personalisation of people's memories um, and people's identities. So it seems to me that, that uh, curators, heritage professionals and so on have an interesting role here where they can try and actually make some connections between people. They can try and say, well, there are some patterns here, there are some commonalities, there are some stories. Um, and it comes back to me to this, this point about a public role, a public role for these organisations. What can they what can they do in terms of creating spaces where people can talk about their shared memories and experiences um, or what sets them apart? The third one about tribalism. Yes, I would say that, that heritage certainly is used, can be used to make a distinction between us and them. Uh, I think that's, that's a given probably and, and certainly the, the literature on identity construction argues that it's about differentiation between us and them. Um, but it's a, there's a question about um, where the tipping point is, where that's positive and that helps with social cohesion, um, and where it tips over into actually uh, a problematic, a, a too strong expression of us as opposed to them, and then it becomes about exclusion, about racism and xenophobia. So it's always about trying to tread the line, really, and, and uh, be, be aware of, of the positive and negative potential of heritage. And again, this is where I would see a role for um, museums and heritage organisations to help societies to reflect on some of those claims. You know, those claims about who we are, who they are, and so on, are often made on the basis of, of I would say, quite shallow evidence in the sort of short historical memory and what interests me is as soon as you go back a little way you can see it's much more complicated and the stories are much more diverse and interconnected so I'm interested in the, the longer deeper perspective that we can bring to these conversations about who we are um, and, and who us and them are. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, a final few questions. Yes, maybe. Thank you. Helen White from Tiny Way Archives and Museums. Uh, I wanted to thank members of the panel for some of the kind words that have been said about the Destination Timeside <laughs> Gallery, which we're responsible for. Compare but, it later. <laughs> I wanted to share an experience I had when I was working in the London Borough Commission about 13 years ago. And um, I was a sort of Absolutely overwhelming. 
And what interested me was that the ethnically diverse population of Lewisham turned out in their ethnically diverse proportions, as it were, totally reflective of the local population, to find out about the history of their houses. And these were first and second generation migrants who'd been living in their houses perhaps since the 50s or the 60s, were absolutely fascinated to know who had lived there before them, how the house had come to be built, how the street had come to be built. And it really sort of taught me a thing or two about not to make assumptions about what histories people are going to be interested in or what they're going to identify with. And it was actually a very, very moving and you know, exciting experience. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Hello, I'm Mark Webb from the Heritage Alliance, um, associated with the Giving to Heritage project. Um, I wanted to pick up on a point that Rihanna had made, about the opportunity for identity and sense of place. Um, and thinking about the theme of the last heritage debate on philanthropy. And, and the urge for philanthropy is often more powerful when there's an emotional connection for the donor. So the question is, could and should identity, heritage and emotion be harnessed together more effectively to generate more social investment and bearing in mind the large disparity between giving in London and the regions? Okay, thank you for that one. Not contentious at all. And yes, final question on the front. It's less of a question, it's more of an observation. I can't speak for all of Scotland, <laughs> but just an observation on the role that heritage played in the referendum, um, a lot of the lack of a role. Um, best as a board, our board decided not to engage in anything specifically around the referendum, and it was interesting, a lot of the uh, political parties who were campaigning for yes avoided looking at, at the heritage because it was maybe too closely associated with, with Braveheart and that sort of notion of Scotland. And so there was quite a distinct move by um, to the SNP not to do that. However, there was obviously a, a huge funding going to the celebration of Ban the Battle of Bannockburn. So there was a sort of, quite a sort of uneasy um, relationship about heritage um, and, and Scotland and what that referendum meant. So there was a lot of discussion around it. We were um, voting yes or no about what a collective of people wanted to be, and we shared a multiplicity of identities. So it was a very interesting um, heritage debate or identity debate to watch how it was navigated by politicians. Thank you very much. Um, I, just a little anecdote. I um, did my um, secondary school teaching practice in Scotland, and I was. Um, it just happened that I went into one school um, to do a six-week stint, um, and so with the third year, as they were then called, I did the um, Wars of Edward I um, with this group of kids in, in a relatively rough end of Stirling. And um, one of the kids asked me at the end of the first lesson, are you teaching us this because you won't be biased, sir? <laughs> <laughs> This year um, sees the bicentenary of one of the buildings that NECT has. And last week uh, I was invited to attend a performance which was planned, um, choreographed, uh, and performed entirely by local people. So instead of it being a form of official heritage, um, you know, this is the official line and we will participate or engage with local people. It was absolutely bottom up, and the stories that emerged um, as they um, recounted for over 200 years, really, of what this building had meant in their society was absolutely amazing, involving um, primary school children right way up to uh, an 85 year old. And I think that for me was the right kind of recognition of what heritage was about. It wasn't packaged, it wasn't in a sense. Um, tidied up or uh, presented, it, it was it was raw, local, emotion. Uh, uh, some of them, the events being very positive, some of them being really quite sore. 
Um, and I felt that this, this really is the absolute essence of what we're about. It might be the stories, it might be about things that happened, events, it might be about things to do with um, the building. So this idea about opening up what heritage means, I think, is the era that we're in. Um, at the last election, um, some of you will remember the, the newspaper headlines about the bonfire of the Quangos and this whole feeling that um, the public sector was going to be dismantled and that, of course, um, us being British will step into the breach and, you know, rather than see all these things lost, we will do everything on a voluntary basis. It's been interesting to see over the last four years how much has been taken up by volunteers, how much has been lost, and this again is something that is a very strong trade within this country, that we have an established third sector, we have an established sense of um, response, social responsibility, um, and, and society plays upon that, whether we're giving financially or whether we're contributing as volunteers. But the volunteer basis of things um, does open up the opportunity for those kind of stories to, to become part of what we're presenting um, as our heritage. Um, the Scottish situation, I think, um, was interesting. There was, um, some of you may have seen in the, um, that most noble of newspapers, the Hexham Courant, um, the uh, mock-up that they did at the border at Carter Bar, showing how you know, it would really look if you, there was a customs point. And I think there was, a, there was an interesting reaction from the North East about what that border meant and about the diversity. You know, were, were we really Scots at heart? And that, well, if the rest of our family got uh, autonomy, we deserve it as well. So looking across that line was a fascinating experience. And um, one of the discussions I've been having since with people is, instead of we now, us now having a disunited kingdom, is Scotland disunited? Um, the, the feelings I'm picking up is that that isn't the case, that people have kind of said, look, we've got it out of our system, let's just move on. But that would be an interesting point to hear from those closer to the ground. Great, thank you. Izzy? Yes, um, I was really interested in the story about um, um, the museum and the diverse groups that attended the exhibition to learn about who had lived in their houses before. And I think what jumped up at me straight away was that, um, and, and related to the back-to-backs thing that I mentioned earlier, is that I think for, and I'll touch on it again, in regards to the talk I was talking about diversity in different groups and so on, is that where groups can find a way in, that's when um, there is an opportunity for that convergence. I think, you know, so in that particular instance there, um, you know, people were interested who lived in the houses before they had. They are, if in effect, treading in the footsteps of certain people before them. And if these houses are 150 years old or 170, it would be wonderful and fascinating. So the linkage and the thread is there, the reason for wanting to know. And I think, you know, something that's really important to me and in the work that matters for me, why, why I care so much, is about representation. I think it's through representation. Representation is a really big word. It's massive. Its implications can't be understated at all. It's through representation we start to bring about greater, I guess, you know, we use the term cohesion or integration, but these ideas that we have, it's hard to describe what they might specifically mean in practice, but it's through representation that we move continually forward and that we allow for people to have conversations and be in the same room together. Um, so that's really fundamentally important to me. Um, along the lines of the philanthropy, I mean, I would just simply say on that that you know, there are particular people who have the money that will send that money on into sort of, um, I guess, causes that they're interested in. The danger is, is that, you know, not just London, but certain kinds of causes will have money head in those particular directions. And so, we ha you know, how do we expand that to make sure that in an environment where we might say there might be increased cuts, and it's happening all the time, and we see the kinds of provision that were more ex inclusive become, um, in, you know, are in danger of being reduced and in fact ended altogether or cut altogether. How do we replace that? Because that inclusion, that, that thing, the processes that brought people together and into a room, different groups and so on, 
without those, without those resources, that stops. And if philanthropy follows the normal routes and channels, then we just see some certain kinds of his histories and heritages represented. And then we have all these huge columns of people in particular areas that are completely missed out altogether. And then we don't have a chance for dialogue and, and sort of joined up learning and working together. Thank you, Rihanna. To pick up on the idea about the house research, again, I would say this is, this is a really good example of where the, the historic environment can be um, used for very powerful effects. So, as Helen was saying, you know, people can find out about people that have been there before. You can then move up a scale to find out which communities were there, and you can trace patterns about, you know, these groups moved here, and then they got more prosperous, and they moved here, typically. So you can then start to plot around a city stories about um, societal change and so on, and connect that, hopefully, back to that individual's house. So it's, it's moving between the individual and the collective. Uh, in, a, in a very effective way. And um, I was struck as well by Izzy, I think you mentioned bus routes, didn't you, my bus? We did a project, um, the project I mentioned earlier in the Lane Art Gallery, we got some young people to talk about their bus journey through Newcastle. And again, it was a fascinating example of how you could get people to um, reflect on their lives, the experiences, of perhaps neighbourhoods they didn't typically get off the bus in, and why that was. Um, they, they would reflect on how the different neighbourhoods looked more well cared for, less well cared for, and you know, there were a whole range of things which flowed from that in understanding people's own experience of place and the, and the groups that they were living alongside, but perhaps not, never, uh, not ever interacting with. Um, on heritage, emotion and identity, I would say they're always connected. Identity is, is an emotional thing, it's an emotional process and heritage is often invoked as a, a source of, of that um, emotion, whether it's pride or nostalgia or um, maybe exclusion possibly sometimes. Uh, how you relate that to philanthropy is quite an interesting question, isn't it? Um, I think in some instances, some topics will provoke an enormous amount emotional charge. I'm thinking of, say, museums that deal with topics like um, the Holocaust or slavery, and I'm sure there that people do feel very connected and probably want to support those kinds of activities. Whether you should try and manage it is, an, is a slightly different issue, I think, because that leads you into a territory of well, are you manipulating people's emotions or are you working with them? So again, it's a quite a fine line, isn't it? I guess it would depend on the individual case. But I think emotion is always part of the equation. I would agree in the, the, the point that, that Izzy just made about um, philanthropy and, and the disparity between perhaps different areas of the country where there'll be more opportunities for philanthropy and also things like business sponsorship. Um, we do have to be careful that that doesn't end up skewing uh, the, the situation so that less well-off areas basically get less access to, to heritage. I think that is a concern. Um, but I'm sure there are many positive ways to think about philanthropy as well. So I sort of wouldn't, certainly wouldn't dismiss um, that as, a, as an important way forward. On the Scottish point, um, yes, I can completely understand why Scottish institutions were were nervous because it was such a such an emotional and controversial and politically sensitive thing. Um, I'm not suggesting that Scottish institutions should have weighed in and said, you should vote this way or you should vote that way. What I was thinking was really to offer a space where people could debate those things and engage with those sorts of questions. Um, because really we're better. We're better than the institutions that hold the material about the history of the, of the Scottish nation or the, the Union. You know, we're better really to have those conversations. And I would say that for the UK as a whole, that these the museums, heritage organisations, they have the material to help us think about these issues. And that's what we should, we should do. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, looking at my watch, we are out and over time, I'm afraid. Um, so it really just leaves me to thank the three speakers for um, very provocative um, contributions. 
they haven't quite answered the question, um, but they have left us with a lot of things to think about. To thank yourselves very much for those questions and for coming this evening. Um, thank you for coming to the university and uh, I hope we see you again soon. And finally, please don't leave the university until you've had um, some of the uh, wine and I understand nibbles and things that are going to be put out for us. Um, and finally, to thank Heritage Alliance for thinking of Newcastle University when they wanted um, a, uh, a venue in the northeast. So thank you very much, and can we um, just thank the three speakers in the normal way?